Gabriel. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for a fascinating talk. I'll need several uh, months, if not years, to digest it all. Um, I want to understand one of the last slides. Do you understand correctly that you're claiming that a one-year-old or a two-year-old does not have free will? And furthermore, I've always thought about free will in a binary fashion, yes or no, but I, I thought you were saying that there's a progression in the development of free will so that a 10-year-old has more free will than a five-year-old, a 20-year-old more than a 10-year-old. Am I understanding correctly what you're saying here? Okay, so let me first say this, of course, is a cartoon. And I have no idea, you know, exactly how much consciousness there is and how much free will there is going to be because to actually do that then in this sort of scientifically testable way, you would actually have to measure it, which is not impossible. If you do what we try to do with all its limitations in adults and finding the main complex, we could do this at different ages, basically, you know, with high resolution MRI and get some, you know, sense of it. Or the other way around, this I think is a useful comment also for consciousness in general. Once you validate these things more and more, it just follows that, for instance, if you have a connectivity like you have in V1 at birth, at least in, in mice, for instance, as well known, where there are no lateral connections yet. Uh, there is only thalamocortical and cortical thalamic connections. So units fire, but they don't interact. There is not going to be any decent consciousness there. When the connections are random, that's bad too. It's only when you start having this pattern, you know, patchy connectivity, then you can have some, for instance, spatial consciousness and then more on. So there are lots of interesting inferences you can make based on a theory of when consciousness is there and what kind of consciousness. Beyond that, I don't know. So if, you know, the question is what, how much consciousness is there at different ages? And then when do true reasons and therefore true decisions come aboard, come into being, really would require to you know, clarify the kind of structure that must be there that corresponds to a reason or an alternative and a decision. And that's why I just sketched it. I would bet, of course, like we all would, that the girl who is you know, doing the cookie paradigm will have clearly or already both the alternatives in her mind and the reasons in her mind earlier on at some point. To your second question, yes, definitely, both conscience and free will are graded. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I think we might have, oh, I see a question from Mark, and then we might have one last question about consciousness from Aaron that is waiting from the previous uh, question session. So Mark, please go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, I have a question about your argument against computer consciousness. Uh, that seems to depend upon how the computer is wired couldn't you actually build a computer that is wired like the brain? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, so th this is a question that we have debated at length and also discussed with you know, people who know much more about computer architectures. In principle, you could build a machine, call it a computer, that is wired like the brain, and then IT would have no principal reason against it being conscious as you and I are once you understand sort of the details of it, okay? Absolutely, it's not that, you know, machine content is not possible because machines are bad, no. It's because, as you point out, how they are wired, okay? Currently, neuromorphic computers, from what I understand, I don't know the very latest, but even though they may have some neuromorphic parts, the bus, for instance, typically is not. And so the moment there is a bottleneck like that, it falls apart. Same is true for the, you know, if you think, could computers connected by the internet, you know, form a giant conscious entity? No, it always goes to the wrong kind of bottlenecks. So I think the current day computers and the typical computers, no, but a potential computer that in the end is physically much closer to our brain, it could. Even that, I'll just, you know, take the opportunity to say so, uh, is more delicate than it might seem at first because this vertical exclusion that I mentioned before that the unit and the time update so to speak and the states that matter are the one that you know guarantee maximum ex intrinsic existence maximum phi that depends on a lot of factors so in the brain it may be the neuron and or the micro column would be my guess okay we still don't know but it's potentially testable thing. What's the real unit, okay? The one for which the system defines itself as existing the most. Is it the neuron or the microcolumns? And don't say, let's say it's the neuron. And then is the transistor say, which would be the natural you know, unit in the computer, good enough? Or it turns out when you analyze it, it actually disintegrates into smaller stuff, 
okay, unlike the neuron. And then all bets are off. So I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I'm saying in principle, sure, you could do it with something that's not a brain. But in practice, current day computers, no, because that we have proven, essentially, it's not published, but it's proven. Uh, they have the wrong architecture. And, uh, you know, others, well, it's complicated and delicate. Thank you, though, for the question. Thank you, Julio. Aaron, please go ahead. All right. Thank you, uh, Julio, for, for an illuminating, uh, excellent talk. Uh, in fact, for two, I should say two excellent talks in a way, right? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll read my question, which I posted earlier to the chat. Um, the axioms that you offered seem to me to describe the contents of consciousness rather than consciousness itself. So suppose I were to assert, I guess I will assert that IIT is a theory that describes how the contents of consciousness are organized rather than a theory of how those consciousness become consciously experienced. So how can we be sure that IIT is a theory of consciousness per se, rather than a theory of how the contents of consciousness are organized? So the contents of consciousness depends how you define them, because the experience itself is just the overarching content. So it's not in IIT the contents are pieces and the experience as such is not a content. It's just the overarching content and experience is its content. Okay. And what the, the axioms are, you know, each axiom typically when I try to really go through them, it's like an hour each. Okay. But the best way to think about them at first is really as an extension of the Cartesian insight. Okay. So what the Cartesian insight says is that there is something, if you wish, rather than nothing. That's one way to put it. And that something is experience. Okay. It's independent of what it might contain. There is just something. And then the axiom of IIT is indeed, uh, each of them are immediate, indubitable, and true of every conceivable experience. And we could go through this exercise for each and every one of them, but not now. But again, they are not specific. That's the whole point to any given content, whether the content is a part of the experience or the experience as a whole. So in other words, the fact that the experience is for the subject is subjective, is true for every conceivable experience. It doesn't matter which experience. It doesn't matter whether I'm seeing something, hearing something, or being in a pure present state. The axiom that is structured is true no matter how it's structured. That it is specific, it says it has to be a particular way, but it doesn't tell you which way. So it's true for every possible experience. And integration, again, it doesn't tell you that the, you know, when I hear a flash, a bang and I see a flash, that is integrated, which IIT says, by the way. Uh, and, and in another experience uh, is not. It's applicable to any possible experience. And finally, that it is definite, it's also true of every conceivable experience. You cannot conceive of any experience. It doesn't matter what you're thinking of or what you're experiencing that's less or more. So it's completely, by definition, independent of any particular content. It's true of every conceivable experience, but it applies to all possible experiences. So, so that's sort of the you know, short answer to that. But the exercise to do really is to see that every axiom is immediate, indubitable, as well as true of every conceivable experience. Um, there are lots of additional things to discuss about what is the role of introspection to actually sort of access the axiom and so on, but let's leave that for another time. <laughs>